The Topeka City Council meeting will come to order. If you will please rise as you are able, give your attention to Councilwoman Clear for the introduction of the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Imago Day Church is a local Wesleyan church congregation located in North Topeka at 1201 Northwest Central Avenue. The church was planted in November of 2011 by two brothers, Joe and Jesse Hodgson who had a desire and a call to plant a church with a transformational presence in North Topeka community. Within a few short years, the building now houses not only Imago Day Church, but a Spanish-speaking congregation and another church plant that meets on Sunday morning. From the beginning, the mission of Imago Day Church has been to declare the redemptive, transformational power of Jesus Christ throughout our community. Reverend Joe Hodgson. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you today for your loving kindness, your mercy, your grace, and your favor. Help us to rest in your good and pleasing perfect will and give us strength, courage, and guidance as we lead our communities and as we make decisions that affect our family and neighbors and as we strive to make this city a better place. Lord, I ask for your blessings upon those here tonight that serve you and serve the people that live here in Topeka, Kansas. Lord, your word tells us that they have been established by you, and we thank you for your loving presence that is with us here as thoughts and ideas are expressed, as people are heard, and as decisions are made. Lord, bless this community, this state, this country, and this world. May we strive to live in unity and harmony together as all of us indeed are created in the Imago Dei, in your image and likeness, and with inherent purpose, value, and worth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Fighters uh, experience.
Well, that gives a good preview to first we'll go over a proclamation here and then have the opportunity for you to tell us a little bit about the, the programs going on. Whereas fire is a serious public safety concern, both locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk from fire. And whereas residential fires in the city of Topeka have killed 14 people in the last five years, and the fire department has responded to over 1,000 structure fires in the last five years. And whereas the Topeka Fire Department has installed over 2,000 free smoke alarms in order to keep our citizens safe, and whereas city, city of Topeka firefighters are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education, and whereas the 2017 Fire Prevention Week theme, Every Second Counts, plan two ways out, plan and practice your home fire escape plan, now, therefore, I, Larry Walgast, Mayor of the City, do hereby proclaim the week of October 8 to 14, 2017, as Fire Prevention Week. And Chief, would you like to describe a little bit more of your activity? Yes, uh, this upcoming weekend, Saturday the, the 14th, we have an open house at uh, Fire Administration Station 3, which is at like 4th and Jefferson. We invite the general public to come out there and view how firefighters on a daily basis uh, train and the equipment they use and get to visit with us and talk about the job, maybe a career, and also there will be refreshments and hot dogs for everybody that attends. Sounds good. And I, I wanted to mention the video was repaired by our communications department, Holly, Molly Hadfield, and our videographer, Travis Bronson. Thank you, and look forward to a good weekend coming up. Thank you. There are no presentations, so we'll proceed with the roll call. Mayor Wilgas? Here. Council Members Hiller? Here. Clear? Here. Ortiz? Here. Emerson? Here. De La Isla? Here. Jensen? Present. Schwartz? Cohen? Here. And Harmon? There are no additions or deletions to the agenda, and Council, we will have one executive session at the conclusion of the meeting. So we'll proceed with consent agenda. is a resolution introduced by Interim City Manager Doug Gerber authorizing the serving of complimentary alcoholic liquor or cereal malt beverage for the first Friday Art Walk events to be held at various businesses as sponsored by Arts Connect, Inc. B is approval of a workers' compensation settlement for Stephen A. Watkins in the amount of $52,000. C are minutes of the regular meeting of October 3rd, 2017, and there are no applications. Okay, that is the consent agenda. Councilman Jensen moves to approve. Councilman Claire seconds. Any discussion? There is no discussion. All those in favor vote yes, opposed vote no. We have nine yes. Nine having voted yes, consent agenda is approved. We go to the action items A, resolution. <coughs> A is a resolution introduced by Interim City Manager Doug Gerber approving the distribution of the fourth quarterly payment of $67,500 to the Topeka Performing Arts Center. Mr. Interim City Manager. Mr. Mayor, thank you. As the body knows, uh, last year you adopted a resolution using some excess funds from the general fund to allocate uh, up to $300,000 to the Topeka Performing Arts Center. Those. Uh, Payments were to be made in four equal distributions of 67500 uh, with the potential at the end of calendar year 2017 uh, of an additional 30000 if TPAC met their metrics. This evening we present to you the fourth distribution um, equaling, making a, for a total of $270,000 and we would stand for any questions you might have. Are there questions on this resolution, Councilman Jensen? Thank you. So if I'm reading the uh, report correct, it does not appear that they will meet their metrics at the end of the year, unless they can pull in a lot in the last quarter. Is that your understanding as well? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Councilman, I, I, in the reading of the report, that's, that's how uh, I would read it as well. I know uh, our finance director has had conversations mm -hmm. with them, and I think she would uh, concur with that assessment at this point okay. in the process. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Your pleasure. Councilman 
Go ahead, Councilman Clare. So, th did they just finish their third quarter or second quarter? Is there on a January to January? Mm -hmm. So, would they just finish third? That's the last one. They, these are Go ahead and answer. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, this is the fourth payment that we're making to them, but it's reflective of their numbers through their third quarter. So, this is our we last payment. Yes, other than the incentivized the $30,000 payment. Okay. Okay, and actually the payments didn't exactly follow on quarters, but it's the last one so that we use, which would be when, as of the last quarter, these are the figures we have. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Other questions? Your pleasure. Councilwoman Claire? Move to approve. She moves to approve. Um, Okay, Councilwoman Ortiz seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor vote yes, opposed vote no. We have eight yes, Mr. Cohen, eight voting yes, Mr. Cohen voting no. Eight having voted yes, the um, resolution is approved. That completes the action items for this evening. We'll go to the non-action items. The clerk would read the first discussion. A is an update on the pavement management program and discussion on plan program activities. Mr. Anthem, City Manager. Mr. Mayor, thank you. As Mr. Peak is coming forward for his presentation, a brief overview for you. Uh, we haven't talked about streets for um, a couple of months, so we didn't want you to miss out on that opportunity and figured you all wanted to talk about streets a little bit. So. Uh, in all seriousness, we wanted to get in front of you and talk about uh, how we're moving forward in the next couple of budget years, how we see the projects happening um, in the scope and in terms of our comprehensive pavement maintenance plan. That's, of course, maintenance, reconstruction, and, and temporary fixes. So Mr. Peek's going to walk through those three items, and he will uh, try to address any questions you might have. Okay, Mr. Peek. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so as interim city manager indicated, I'm gonna give you an update on the uh, program and just so we keep talking uh, the same language, how did we get to, to this program update? Uh, last year we started with a talk about what is the condition of our streets. And so this image or map reflects kind of that condition score of all our, our streets within the city of Topeka. This was done uh, in 2016. It's available on the website if any of the People watching want to go out and find out what their street is rated. And it's very important in an asset management program that we kind of know where we are. And then through discussions uh, with the governing body, we kind of set an expectation or a goal of where we want to be. And we talked about that pavement condition index or PCI, we're currently at a 55. And through that discussion, we said over the next 10 years, we want to increase that uh, at a minimum to a 60, if not exceed that, aspiring for a 70. And so the governing body, through the approval of the 2018 CIP, as well as the uh, operating budget money towards that goal, uh, basically so that we're maintaining an average annual funding of a little over $24 million annually over the next 10 years uh, to help us achieve that goal. So I just want to kind of refresh of that's where uh, where we're coming from. The other change in what we're doing in pavement management, we talk a lot about projects during CIP, but the importance of a pavement management program is we talk about strategies and how we invest the dollars that the community gives us to reach those pavement management goals. And within that, there's really kind of three primary strategies I wanted to, to talk about. Uh, we invest in preventative maintenance uh, so kind of up at the uh, the top left of the screen, that's what, you know, crack seal, you see the uh, the black sealant along the line to the pavement. That's a early and often type of treatment, but there are other preventative maintenance uh, treatments we do, full width surface sealing uh, and some other things. On the right hand side, we have full depth repairs. This also includes things like pothole repairs and what we call stopgap measures. Sometimes these don't do anything to improve the overall condition of the pavement, but they fix an immediate hazard. Uh, if we had a big pothole that someone may damage their vehicle or trip or fall, those types of things we fix. But then we also have full depth repairs that we're doing strategically. We're going in and patching in one year 
and then maybe in the next year coming back and doing a more structural uh, repair over the entire part of that road. And then on the bottom of the slide, we have kind of the two major repairs, and this is what the community is most familiar with. We kind of have what we call re rehabilitation uh, activities on the uh, bottom left. That would include things like mill and overlay, where we remove, grind off the uh, amount of the surface and replace that. So that's a structural repair that adds uh, significant life back to a roadway. And then on the right-hand side, we have reconstruction. We have a lot of roads that the most cost-effective strategy is to replace them. And then we also need to coordinate that with all our other utility partners, both public and private, to make sure we're renewing that underground infrastructure uh, at the same time. In order of cost, preventative maintenance is very uh, cheap compared to rehab uh, and reconstruction. The analogy I like to use uh, with you folks is about car maintenance. You know, you buy a new car, you gotta change the oil early and often, that extends the life. That's what we're talking about, preventative maintenance. Rehab, ultimately you've gotta replace tires or brakes, that's more costly, but uh, needed. And ultimately at some point you're replacing that car. It's, it's reached its useful life. Uh, so that's just kind of a general summary of, we've taken that goal, the budget dollars you've given, and then we're looking at these strategies and then I wanted to walk you through our process, how we ultimately get to the projects that the citizens see out in the community. And so we call this our project development process. I'm gonna start in the upper right with kind of number one. We talked about that. We have our pavement condition scores. We kind of know what that, that baseline is. And then as we complete projects, we have to go in and update. This is a within a software model of this information. We run uh, basically uh, scenarios that generates the output. So as we complete a project, we renew that pavement or we do preventative maintenance, we input that information uh, into the model because it affects that PCI score. Then the next step is we take the budgets uh, that are approved by you and we load those in uh, to this model. We set the PCI goals, so what's the aspiration for that level of service we're working towards. And then we also put in the planned pavement CIP projects. So we've got a number of projects that are fixed. The voters approved uh, the countywide sales tax that listed very specific projects that we're doing. As we get into the sort or the neighborhood planning, those neighborhoods may pick very specific projects as part of their neighborhood plans. And so these are fixed projects uh, that we need to load in there. And then basically we run the model. And what that is is it's an algorithm that's looking at what budget's available, what goals, what work do you have planned, and out of that, what recommendations for fixing pavement. And so in a sense, this model is kind of siloed. It's not looking at what the utility department is doing or other providers, it's just looking at that pavement. And so it provides recommendations uh, for us to look at, implement those projects, and then ultimately uh, update the model and do this cycle on an annual basis. So with all that being said, I wanted to kind of uh, bring you up to date where we are with the pavement management program. But we included two maps uh, within your project. Uh, this first map is what we call the preventative maintenance projects. So these are the things that I uh, will be doing crack sealing, full width surface sealing, and there will be some patching done as part of this process. Uh, let me educate you on what, what the map represents. Uh, so the uh, green, yellow, and red colored streets, those are the project ro uh, locations over the time period of 2017, 2020, that we will be doing this, this major preventative maintenance work. As a matter of fact, we're, we're taking bids uh, open tomorrow uh, for the first phase of crack sealing, the, the 2017 uh, crack sealing program, uh, which is kind of in the center area. We divided the city into three packages over these three years, and the rationale behind that is uh, when we get contractors bidding, it's more efficient if the work is centralized in a location, that we don't have them going from one side of town to the other. So we tried to geographically package these into similar areas, and then some of the outlying areas we're actually gonna have uh, our internal folks uh, do some of the crack sealing out there um, so that we get better bid prices on this. But basically we'd be working from the, uh, the center in 2017, 2018, 
going to be working the preventive maintenance program uh, kind of on the uh, eastern and northern part of uh, the community 2018 2019 and then the south and the western part of the community in 2019 and 2020. In total, this covers about 225 lane miles of pavement over the next three years. That's about 14% of our pavement system. And so just keep that 225 uh, in your mind as, as we talk about uh, the next slide. But I wanted to stop and see if there were any questions on preventative maintenance slide here. Do the, um, the three divisions, are they have about the same amount of street miles in each or? So we're not favoring one area yes, over the so, others. Uh, you know, the governing body uh, designated the excess countywide sales tax funding approximately $10 million towards this effort. So we basically loaded that as $3.3 million annually. How much work could that buy? And that's basically how the, the division of work uh, got packaged. Um, the other thing I, f I forgot to mention is, like I said, we're opening bids on crack ceiling. It's a... Uh, kind of a uh, fall spring process. So in the fall, we're doing major crack ceiling work. And then in the spring, we're doing uh, the full width surface ceiling. Uh, so we're basically getting these roads prepped to come in and have uh, the full width surface ceiling. Uh, Councilor Emerson mentioned it several meetings ago, we did a demo project um, in the Central Park neighborhood uh, where you basically have a paving machine that comes down, puts down a very thin uh, layer of an asphalt product that it uh, seals the entire surface and it buys us seven to ten years of extra life on that pavement you know in a, a ballpark range of four dollars a square yard you know which is uh, four times less the cost of say a mill and overlay and somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, six times less the cost of, of the full reconstruction so it's a very uh, Good investment of our dollars extending 225 lane miles, buying another seven to 10 years before any major work's needed. And if we do this on a regular basis, some of these roads, you can continue this preventative maintenance process with only minor patching uh, for, you know, 15, 20 years out. Good, thank you. Questions? Councilman Jensen. Thank you. Uh, so the roads that are not covered under this program, am I to assume that those are going to need uh, more intensive care than just the uh, preventative maintenance? So yes, some of those. Uh, as we talked about in, in that goal of reaching that PCI 60, uh, we still have what are, is called the backlog streets mm -hmm. that really the most cost effective investment is reconstruction. Okay. And even at the end of 10 years, we're going to still have streets that need reconstruction. Sure. But reaching that goal of 70 helps us to start eat away uh, at that backlog and knock it out. We also have, I mean, the, the other part we'll show is um, the major work and replacement kind of covers some, mm -hmm. some different streets. So there's others uh, that aren't reflected on this map. And then we still have the um, our crews, uh, the internal forces that do pothole repair. Mm -hmm significant pavement repairs, et cetera, that aren't reflected on this map. Well, it may not be a popular statement, but I appreciate the fact that uh, a huge chunk of these roads are actually in good shape that you're putting in the maintenance program. That, yeah. that means we're That's attempting to keep the good roads good longer. Yeah. And uh, I know there's a lot of folks out there that want their bad roads repaired, but the only way we're gonna dig out of this hole is to maintain the good ones and keep them good. So I, I appreciate the fact that you have a significant number of roads that you're investing in now to maintain that. Thank you. Yeah, Councilman Clare. I probably jumped the gun here before we looked at the next slide, but um, how does this correlate with the pavement condition index? Because a lot of the streets I see on here are not on either one of these, but, right. they, but yet they're very poor. Yeah, so we're looking at a, a three year period and those poor streets that have a, that low pavement condition index score, that's that backlog of streets that need reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So we're typically not doing preventative maintenance or rehab type of work. So some of those streets won't be addressed. Until over, when? Over that 10 year period. I mean, that we will not physically touch every street in the city with a brand new road over the next 10 years. So the poor is gonna get poorer while the, while the fair is gonna stay fair. So the fair is going to be staying fair and some of it's going to come up into a better category because we're providing some of these treatments. But that's the simple fact. We, 
the capital investment required to bring all the poor roads up to a good condition, how uh, you know, we don't have the budget to support that, nor the coordination with all the other underground infrastructure that would need to be replaced over that same period of time uh, to deliver that. And that's the importance of a pavement management program is that we're setting this goal of over time raising that overall condition. So that doesn't mean that you know we can address all those streets over the 10 year period, but we're increasing the overall quality of, of the pavement system in Topeka over the 10 year period. And as we continue to do this, it's a long term thing, mm -hmm. That reconstruction pot gets smaller, the number of good and fair roads increases, and then our overall budget dollars, provided our inventory remains relatively the same, starts to decline because we're we're spending more money on these types of activities as opposed to replacement and reconstruction. And I understand that, except if I'm on one of these failed roads, I'm not gonna be happy with that. I mean, what are we gonna do if People can't even drive so We still them. have our internal crews that do pothole repairs and those types of activities to keep those roads in a serviceable condition. So they'll be serviceable. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so even remember, though they're. I mean, if, uh, if we talk about kind of that pavement condition index, I showed you the picture of uh, Northeast Curtis mm -hmm. Street under the Kansas Avenue Bridge. That road's a zero on the PCI scale. But you can drive it, I mean, you can travel that road. But in that PCI scale, it's, it's a zero, meaning that the pavement is past its useful life. Our only investment option is, is to replace it. Um, and so, you know, that, that's just the, the fact. So what's it gonna look like in 10 years? It's a zero now, what's it gonna be in 10 years before we even start looking at it? It'll be a zero. I mean, is it gonna be a we minus 10? No, ma'am. <laughs> minus. Well, on the other thing now, what you're saying, this is all being done with the money or the, with the excess funds from the Hefson sales tax, which was about 10 million over three years. So if we hadn't received that, none of these would be done in this process. Perhaps they'd go in someplace else, but so this is in addition to what our regular yes, CIP sir. is doing. That's correct. Other thing, other moving on, we have, yeah, go ahead, Councilman Ortiz. Well, and I might be jumping the gun, one word for you, you know what that word is, right? You know where I'm going, right? Right outside, what's that? You said that one year we, in one year we patch, so we patch this year, and then the next year we fix it. So we're fixing outside 7th Street? So, uh the parking lots between City Hall and County, we've talked about uh, doing a design process next year. I uh, just wanted to evaluate the overall operation and then ultimately replacement of that. And we're handling that through an internal fund because that, while it's a parking lot, it's, it's kind of separate from this pavement management system uh, to look at. So we'll be starting a design process looking at the the parking lots between the county and city buildings next year, but we won't be making any wholesale uh, repairs to those parking lots next year. That's that's really sad because I've been sitting here 12 years <laughs> and they've been screaming for 12 years that that needs to be done. Yes, ma'am. So I will continue to push you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Peak. Yes, ma'am, I understand. Councilman Hiller. Well, along those lines, I just want to throw in, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with this. You know, we want to maintain what we have so we can keep pulling up the rear. I do know that when people have called me about streets that were terrible, the one that pops to mind was, is 6th Street that's just now being done between Gage and Fairlawn. The potholes were so bad and the sides were crumbling and people said, what are we going to do? And I've learned with, there's a street in my district or anywhere is just to say, is to teach people about C-Click Fix and tell them don't be afraid to call. A lot of times people don't want to call too often or they felt bad about it. And uh, I think people are getting better about calling and seeing that there will be results. And so I just tell them, you correct me if I'm wrong, you just call as often as you take, they will come out and patch that thing until we finally get it, get to where we can fix it, but don't be afraid to call. Is that? I, I absolutely, That's call. Really but what helped. I'd say is we, we have a process internally mm -hmm. for potholes evaluating whether they're priority one, two, right. or three. And basically what that priority one means is, is that that's a hazard. And so those are always gonna be taken care of first. So someone may call and say, hey, I've got a pothole. We come out and evaluate it, and it may be three, four weeks before we schedule the work on that. 
or it may be something that's tied to one of these larger projects. So they may do a, a, a throw and go with cold patch material, just hold it <laughs> knowing that we've got a larger project. <laughs> but I mean, that uh, the call, I mean, we could definitely can explain that. Too. I, I think it's been working was my point, and I have heard really good response about yeah. C-Click Fix. Once people try it, they really like it. So. I appreciate that we're getting all these pieces yes. in order. Okay. Shall we go to the next map? So the next map. Uh, so, you know, this, uh, this map here, I'll walk you through what this is showing. All these solid colored lines are projects that are already identified from 2017 to 2020 in the CIP. So the, the CIP that you approved this year reflected all the projects uh, with solid color lines. The dash lines, as we run through the model, it says paver recommendations. Our model, uh, the software system is called micro paver. So with that additional budget that you allocated out of the, the operating budget, basically generated these additional projects over 2017 to 2020. So what's important to, to say is these are proposed We've not coordinated these projects. These are major work. So this could be mill and overlay. This could be a replacement on these projects. And when I say coordination, we have to think all about all the different projects going on. Our utilities department has a number of priorities for water, sewer, and storm repair. So we need to look how these align and see if there's a way that we can kind of leverage those dollars uh, to pay for joint projects. We also have um, bikeways. Uh, you know, other plans that are being developed within the community that have specific projects. So we need to look at how those are overlap. So as we've generated this output <coughs> this Friday, uh, both the utilities and public works department are starting that internal dialogue. We're actually planning for the 2019 CIP. And so we're having this conversation internally. Here's kind of the recommendations from the pavement management system on where we need to be working. We're gonna have the conversation with the utilities and other departments about their priorities so that we kind of vet these projects and make sure that these are viable recommendations. Uh, and then uh, put that in a package that comes to you uh, through that 2019 CIP recommendation. And then some of these may be mill and overlay projects that don't require utility work and those are things that we can go ahead and program into uh, those operating funds that um, were budgeted for 2018. And so um, that just kind of gives you a snapshot of where we are, the planning process, uh, and the project recommendations. And like I said, this is, it's new to everyone. So we're, we're learning and process, but that's the cycle that will be happening uh, from here on out with pavement management. Councilman Emerson. Um, thank you, Jason. I just wanted to say I really appreciate this. Um, this is exactly what you promised when we allocated the money last year to do the, um, the scanning of the roads to come up with our pavement condition index originally, uh, especially this maintenance program that you laid out for the next three years. I mean, it's, it's data driven. I mean, the way you've divided the city and made it efficient for contractors to have packages. I mean, this is just fantastic. I, I really appreciate this. And um, knowing that, um, I mean, it's possible we could have seven new faces up here next year. And the only <laughs> problem I see is this is a 10 year program. And the only danger I see is we have to stay the course on this. If, if we do this for a year and then next year, we start monkeying around with this, we're never gonna get ahead. So I guess I would, uh, I would hope that uh, if there's several of us still here, I guess I'd hope that we uh, stay the course on this because we have to keep doing this year after year. That's the only way we're ever gonna yeah. um, get ahead on this. So thank you very much. I really appreciate all the work. Thank you. Councilman Jensen. Thank you, Your Honor. I will echo the comments of my esteemed colleague. Um, the only thing I would ask is, uh, Let's let's have a complete schedule. Um, everybody deserves to know when their road will be replaced as part of this 15, 20 year program. And I know that, that forecasting that far out is, is difficult to do, um, but there's a lot of people that have been in lingo for 50 years or longer with road maintenance and complete replacement. And um, I, I really think that we deserve to give them something, even if it's just a year range. You know, we're, we're predicting this quadrant in five to 10 years, 10 to 15, that sort of thing. We, we've got to give some people hope out there that they are not forgotten. Um, this is excellent work. 
fabulous. Uh, this is the kind of data-driven response that we wanted to see. Um, I would just hope that the, the folks out there that uh, – don't see their street on this map. You know, we haven't forgotten about you. Uh, we're working to get to you. It is very, very difficult uh, to forecast that far out. Um, but if we can give give people some kind of indication that we're coming at some point, I think that would really go far for a lot of folks who don't see themselves on the next, I mean, five years of road work. For some people, that's, that's gonna be longer than they're willing to wait, I'm afraid. Thank you. You know, I think an example is 12th Street, which is yellow, and it says over there 2013 approved. So what does it mean for, has the design work been done? And so, we construction in yeah, 2013. Kind of the, the, you know, the countywide sales tax, I mean, we have a cash flow that comes in with that. And so 2019 is where that project is programmed within the countywide sales okay. tax fund. Okay. And so uh, that's going to be a very complicated project. Yeah. I don't think we want to have that entire limits of a 12th Street under construction at one point in time, given all the access that's off that. So we're gonna start early on looking at how to phase that. And then also, like I said, just the utility coordination alone on that project is gonna take a lot of work because we have some major transmission lines, both uh, from public and private utilities along that corridor. Okay, very good, thank you. Councilman Hiller. I like the three years in terms of what we can hold in our hands and talk to constituents about. Um, as chair of the MPO, I know that we just approved um, KDOT coming in at, at the at, at Gage, where Gage goes into the interstate, and one of my flaming pothole calls was somebody who was concerned about that, I remember. You remember some of them. I think it would be helpful, even though we're not paying for them directly, if the KDOT projects could be on here as well, in pink or something, just so we have all the projects that we're expecting in those years. Just a suggestion. Other Thanks. questions, comments, discussion? Seeing none, thank you very much. Very helpful, very interesting. Appreciate it. I'll go to item B. B is an overview of regulations <clears throat> pertaining to pedestrians who solicit contributions from vehicles, panhandling. Mr. Andrew, City Manager. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, as always, a brief overview as Mr. Gagne approaches the podium. Uh, over the last, particularly over the last probably six weeks, I've gotten a lot of calls and emails about panhandling, uh, not only from this body, from but from the public. And uh, rather than me try to take those calls and do all that research, it's something that uh, an area of the law, uh, which Mr. Gagne is familiar with, so he's done some additional research into this area and thought it might be helpful this evening for him to talk through some of the things we can and can't do in relationship to this issue and then even potentially how it rates, relates to some of the broader issues that we have in the community. He's gonna go through a number of slides for you. They're pretty text heavy and they talk a lot about um, cases from other jurisdictions and that's important and it sets the basis for what we really want to be a Q&A tonight with, with Luther in the body. And so with okay. that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Gagne. Very good, okay, thank you, welcome. Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, um, what I'm gonna talk about is some of the legal rules on trying to restrict panhandling. And these slides that I have, they are text heavy as the city manager said, but <laughs> these are very summarized uh, points from case decisions. And the point of this discussion I hopefully will be that um, nowadays, modern times, the way the court system has addressed some of these cases, this is a real minefield to try to enter with regulations. And I know we get a lot of questions about it, uh, a lot of complaints. Probably one of the first things to talk about, um, I've written, let me back up for a second, I've written this um, concerning medians but these rules that I'm gonna discuss will be the same no matter whether you're talking about a street corner, um, the sidewalk, the right-of-way, or standing in the median. The, the courts 
uh, decisions on these cases are going to be very similar, uh, similar types of rules. What makes a difference is in the city's justification for passing the ordinance, whether it's crime or public safety, concern for accidents, it, it makes a difference on where the person is standing. But the analysis that the court is going to go through doesn't change that much. So the first question when you talk about these kinds of restrictions is what exactly is being prohibited? Uh, right off the bat, you run into an issue, well, you, you can't just focus on panhandlers because there's other types of activity going on out there. Uh, there's charitable contributions, um, kids, uh, different civic organizations, advertising, political campaigns, all of this type of activity is occurring out there too, but we don't see it as much because it's not what people are complaining about. We actually do have an ordinance um, that was adopted as part of our big package of traffic ordinances, the STO, Standard Traffic Ordinance. Out in the middle of that is a section STO 69, and on its face, it talks about no person shall stand on a highway for the purpose of soliciting employment, business, or contributions from the occupant of a vehicle. Kind of sounds like maybe we already have a panhandling ordinance. I'll come back to that in a minute. The problem is, is that we, we can't enforce this. Um, it's been looked at, and um, the legal department's opinion is, is this is probably unconstitutional. And that piece that I've got underlined there is what I'll come back to in just a minute. A couple of these cases that I'm going to talk about in the last two and a half, three years, there's been a lot of court decisions on this topic. Uh, three of them I'm going to mention specifically. Uh, one is a Supreme Court case, uh, you may have heard of it, called Reed uh, versus Town of Gilbert uh, out of Arizona. This one, uh, Cutting versus City of Portland, Maine. This was a First Circuit opinion. Um, it had to do with a city that passed an ordinance that basically tried a different approach. Instead of trying to limit panhandling on right-of-ways and sidewalks, street corners, they went at it by restricting people's ability to use that center island, the median. And one thing they did when they wrote this is they wrote it very broadly, that they made it unlawful for anybody to use that median for anything other than a pedestrian crossing the street. I think the thought was at the time they avoid the problem of <coughs> trying to restrict somebody's free speech right, but picking and choosing which speech we like and which speech we don't like. So they, they tried to avoid that by making it broad enough nobody can use it. They didn't specify any specific uh, medians. Uh, it applied to all medians in the town, whether big ones or small ones, busy intersections, stop signs, stop lights, didn't matter. Any median in town, they made it unlawful for any person to be in that median strip. What ended up happening is when they came time for enforcement, they enforced it against panhandlers. And as because it's the case, they got sued. That's how we have cases. <laughs> and this is some of the language from the court opinion on it. And one of the things the court discusses is this location of a median strip or even the right of way or the street corner, sidewalk area. Those are recognized by courts as traditional public forums. That's important for First Amendment law because that's a very protected area. Um, it's, a, it's an area that's been recognized by the court as where the public goes to discuss ideas. And when it comes to the government, the government's ability to limit that, it, we're very restricted on what we can do because of its designation as a traditional public forum. Hmm. So, get rid of the court. 
Now, restrictions on speech. There, there's two ways courts can look at it. it is either it's content-based or it's content-neutral. And it has to do with what is the restriction, the law, ordinance, what is it trying to do? Is it based on the speaker's content or is the law content-neutral? Content-based regulations, um, they have something called strict scrutiny that gets applied to those. That's the highest level of you know, speech protected by the First Amendment. The government tries to pass a law regulating it. Strict scrutiny is at the top of the most severe um, restriction and scrutiny that the court will give a law because it has such an impact on uh, First Amendment rights. With strict scrutiny, uh, the government has to prove that the restriction is necessary uh, for a compelling interest and is narrowly tailored to achieve that. That's legal language, but basically what the court is saying is that it's got to be very well crafted, no other way to do this. This is the only way we can do it is by passing this law. It's kind of what they're getting at. If a law is content-based, the, the court finds that the law is content-based, that it's, it's restricting speech based on its content. We start out in a position where the government's law is presumed unconstitutional right off the bat because it's based on the content of the speech, presumed unconstitutional. And then from there, the government is um, it's up to us to justify that it's necessary that there's no other way we could do this. So a minute ago I said that I would come back to this ordinance that we have. The part that I've got underlined here, for the purpose of, that's kind of a big indication that we're content-based when we say for the purpose of, because it's not all speech that we're trying to regulate. We're trying to regulate soliciting, employment, business, or contributions. We're picking categories of speech to regulate. So it's been our opinion that because of this language in this ordinance, if this were challenged in court, it would probably be strict scrutiny that would get applied to it. So we would have to show that this is necessary to further a compelling government interest, narrowly tailored, and that kind of thing. Court. Cities have had really bad luck meeting that standard <laughs> when it comes to panhandling. The other type of approach uh, that courts uses um, when the regulation does not concern the content of the speech, it says it's content neutral. Um, that subject, um, it's given a lower level of scrutiny by the court. And it has to be narrowly tailored to serve a significant government interest, leaving open alternative channels for the communication. A little bit lesser standard, basically. It doesn't have to be the only way we can do it, but there has to be alternatives, and we have to be narrowly tailored not to be uh, restricting more speech than we need to. This ordinance um, <clears throat> that the city of Portland, Maine, in this cutting case, uh, what it did is it prohibited all speech, all activity on all median strips in the city. <clears throat> so it looked good at first because it was content neutral. They're not concerned about what the content of the speech is. Where it ran into a problem, though, is with the narrow, the narrow tailoring requirement. <clears throat> The city was concerned with public safety. That was the reason why they passed this ordinance to begin with, because of people standing in the middle of the median strip. They were concerned that somebody was going to get hit, uh, somebody get uh, hurt or killed by a vehicle. What happened, though, was they didn't have any evidence to show that some intersections were more dangerous than others. Uh, there's a big difference between a major five-lane intersection controlled by traffic lights versus some little intersection that's off the beaten path controlled by stop signs. There's a major difference there in the, in the danger factor. 
the city didn't take that into account. They just passed a blanket, blanket prohibition on everything. So the court, um, First Circuit, when they reviewed this case, they said that it was over-inclusive. Um, it, was, it was too broad. Um, by not taking that, um, the specific location of the intersection and the traffic conditions, it was too broad of a sweep. By, by just banning all of them, it, it didn't meet that narrow tailoring requirement. The other thing that they, the city had uh, in this case was they didn't have any stats to back it up. They were afraid, they had fear that somebody was going to get hurt or killed, but when they actually looked at the data, they, they couldn't come up with it. Uh, nobody had been run over that they knew of. They, they didn't have any major accidents or anything like that. And it was really just a concern that something bad was going to happen. Nothing bad had actually happened. The court actually said that you can't base this restriction on that, that without the data to back it up, you're not narrowly tailored to justify this restriction. Hmm. <laughs> this was the summary from this opinion. In short, the city's not shown that it seriously undertook to address the problem of less intrusive people readily available. Um, they're also talking there about other laws being available. Um, instead of restricting speech, we already have ordinances uh, for pedestrians being in the street uh, when there's sidewalks. Uh, we have an ordinance on that that is enforceable. We have another ordinance that um, makes it unlawful to obstruct traffic. Uh, people stopped at stoplights, you know, after they turn green because they're digging in the glove box or something for a dollar. That can be enforced as well. You can't obstruct traffic that way. So when the court says this, but they're, they're looking at those three things. It was a blanket prohibition at all intersections with no data to back up their fears and with other alternatives that they could consider on how to address this problem. Those three things, the court said, sacrifice speech for efficiency. They just passed a blanket prohibition saying nobody can use the median strip for anything. And then enforced it against people that were panhandling. This is a case, um, Thayer versus City of Worcester. It was a very similar type of case. It was out of Massachusetts. Uh, earlier this year, um, <clears throat> there was a, an updated opinion on this. Uh, this case actually went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court and was vacated and had to go back down to the trial court for a new opinion. And that's what this was when it came out, was an award of attorney's fees. <laughs> I put this on there, just this is a consideration, because you, if the city, with the way the case law is, they pass <coughs> these kind of ordinance, ordinances and they enforce them, the likelihood of getting sued is pretty high. City of Worcester got ordered to pay $519,000 in legal fees. They were asking for a million, and the court cut it in half, but still, $519,000. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Uh, Councilman Emerson? <laughs> yes, sir. So, so, Luther, you've, uh, you've given us, I think, three examples of what doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any that, have there been any examples that do work? There are. Um, Putting this together, I wasn't sure how broad to make this presentation, but there are plenty of examples out there of communities that are doing it differently. It doesn't involve trying to make it illegal. It involves other things such as um, educational uh, things put out to the public about don't give to panhandlers, uh, give to these agencies that are there to help, trying to uh, direct people that that may be wanting to help people that may be out there. Um, some places have put out um, television commercials. They've even gone that far. They put up signs at the intersections uh, directing people that if you want to give money, uh, give it to this. Uh, some places use repurposed parking meters. Um, 
Some places will also um, have more effort put into their uh, kind of related uh, re related issues to um, like camping on, on public property and uh, homelessness and shelter capacity and that kind of thing and, and it's all kind of tied together but the approach that cities are having success with is is not making it illegal it's doing alternatives to discourage it and address the problem rather Con than trying to ban it. Councilman Jensen. Thank you, Your Honor. So if medians are such hallowed space, then how are we able to regulate parades? I mean, because that is by itself an act of free speech as well. Right. So now I'm concerned that there are a whole host of other things that we could get in serious trouble for. Well, the parade is something that um, it's a little different because it's such a you're basically taking over the street and repurposing it for something else besides vehicle traffic. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think that's the, the difference there. But I could argue a median was not designed for people to stand on and solicit things. Well, so we're also taking over and repurposing something there. True. And I realize this is a slippery slope. I'm just, uh, you know, that if, if we can get in trouble on one thing, people love to take a molehill and make it into a mountain. Is yeah, that I mean, something we've ever considered? It, traffic safety is one of the big areas where the, the government does have the authority to regulate. And within that is a category of time, place, and manner restrictions mm -hmm. where our interest in keeping things safe mm -hmm. allows us to impose certain reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions on how you can do an activity. So if we could show there was a significant danger to somebody standing on a particular median, then we could prevent them from doing that is essentially what you're saying? Potentially, yeah, if we have the data to back it up. These case examples that mm -hmm. I've shown you is where cities have passed the law, right. gone to court, and they don't have the data to back it up. So basically, people have to die before we're <laughs> able to tell or okay, to show that moving. it's a serious. Well, I mean, it, <laughs> yeah, it's well, a serious well, issue. Right. It's I, silly. Yeah, I, it, it's yeah. true. Councilwoman Clear. So is this? So is our next meeting on the median out at Wanamaker and Twenty Ninth? How does this tie together with the camping? Well, that's my calls. Okay, well, you want to define yeah. what you mean by camping? Camping, uh, yeah, camping like a no-to area down at sure. the end of this. Do you know what I'm talking okay. about? I do know what you're talking it's about. It's where if somebody camps yeah. on a right pro on property, on not on the street, but on public or yes. I, I've been out with the police and I've, I've seen what they're what they're saying and what's going on out there, and it's pretty common for the people that are panhandling to also be camping. And you don't see them as much because they're in the trees and they're up under the brush, but they're out there. They're along the river, they're under the bridge. Mm -hmm. But those two activities are very closely related because it's the same, a lot of the same people that are doing it. Okay. But what does that have to do, with, why can't, what does that have to do with the free speech of them camping? So because, why? like, camping out on Wanamaker, they're very close to where they're doing their panhandling at. So if you make the camping, uh, if you address that, give them somewhere else to stay or make that unlawful to camp on that property out there, it's not so easy then to panhandle it, you know. So we can do that. We can say no camping here. You can, but it's tricky because that's tied to your shelter capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, people have to have alternatives. And um, they look at whether your shelter has the capacity to handle anybody that wants a bed and whether your shelter has rules. Do you turn people away for reasons? Mm -hmm. And depending on what your answer is to those, you may or may not be able to ban camping in public because the way the court looks at it is you essentially make it a crime for something that people have no alternative for. And if they can't stay in the shelter, then they don't have any other choice but to sleep in public. So the argument goes. Yeah, if they have no alternat right. alternative. So you have to have alternatives. And if you have alternatives, then you can address the camping, and the camping is connected, and you don't have it's not as easy and accessible to the locations where the panhandling. No, but we need done. to figure it out. Because I've gotten lots of calls about yeah. people.
we're, we're upset about that. Yeah. We have a Deputy Mayor Cohen, and then let's, then we'll go to a city manager at that okay. point. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. What about just simple uh, sign that says no loitering? Can, could we do that? Um, loitering laws have kind of had a similar fate, but for a different reason, is they're vague. And a lot of those have been struck down. Um, we don't have loitering laws anymore, vagrancy laws, some people call them, because of the vagueness problem of them. You have to specifically define the conduct that's prohibited. I, uh, one question was, um, are the, the rules are all about the same for someone panhandling on a sidewalk on a street? You know, is that is that different? Is that treated differently? That would be. Uh, these rules that I've had uh, up here, they're they're about the same for as far as the court's concerned on how they're going to analyze the problem. What changes is the government's rationale for doing it, whether we're talking about the sidewalk or the median or the street corner. We have a little bit different argument on the public safety aspect of that. Okay. The interim city manager had a point. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I was, I was just going to follow up on a comment Luther made and have him maybe clarify a little bit in his response to Councilwoman Clear. I want to differentiate between, yes, you can legally ban camping with maybe we're not going to be able to do that in Topeka based on the shelter right. that we have and some of the options that we have for folks. So it's legally allowable, but it's not necessarily something that we're legally comfortable pursuing in Topeka. Not to put words in your mouth. No, but. and that, that's right. I mean, what I was trying to explain was a camping ordinance, public camping ordinance, is something that cities have uh, in other areas and other locations. It's possible, but you have to have the right circumstances and the right community in order to be able to do it legally. Councilman Clear. So it's my understanding that Lawrence has a no camping on Mass Street because they did not want to mess with Massachusetts. They wanted no camping down there. So they passed that for that area. Is Can we not do that here for like no camping in Noto or? Uh, potentially, I mean, it, it depends on our purpose, on how we are able to articulate the reasons why we're doing this and what our legitimate government interest is, uh, what alternatives the people have. Okay. Okay, it is difficult, I think, as we see. Um, yeah, Debbie Mayor Cohen. I get a lot of the calls, too, because that's in my district along uh, Wanamaker. Um, the takeaway was the median is recognized as a stage for free speech. Is that what you said it was? The yeah. courts recognize the median as a stage for free form. speech. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. As well as standing on the side next to the stop sign <laughs> right. is also a public forum. Okay. And it's not just medians. Uh, it's I know. Lots of different areas, but that's where the people are standing to panhandle. Okay. Councilman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. One of the things that's developed lately that a, a number of us have gotten reactions from and seen is people who sort of pick a corner and they're there every day and they have the sign every day. Um, and we have a sign ordinance that says you have to have a permit, just like we have to have a permit for a parade or for demonstrating on the sidewalk. We do have an ordinance that says if you're going to have a sign in a certain, there's only certain places you can have signs and based on the size, this, it either is or isn't allowed. And to me, if somebody's coming every day with this sign, an angle that we could take is that they're in violation of the sign ordinance. Could you react to that? Or later if it's something you haven't considered? I think there's a difference because sign ordinances, they're talking about something that's fixed. Uh, the restriction is putting something there that's fixed and it's going to stay there and uh, site obstructions and stuff like that versus a panhandler that may get up and move around. And but a lot of these people are in exactly the same place every day with the same sign. Um, often in the street corner where a sign otherwise wouldn't be allowed because it's in the sight triangle on the street corner where you can't have bushes over 30 inches tall and you can't have a, you can't install a sign. 
Right. So. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, <coughs> I mean they just it's have an interesting legs question. instead of wires or something. <laughs> it's a sign. I, I think the point to be taken from a lot of these is it's really perilous for cities to try to ban things in this area with the way the court cases are. We're, we're asking for trouble. The cities that are having success with it are taking a different approach. They're discouraging it. We can put up our own sign. Don't give to panhandlers. Support your local charity. There's cities that are doing that and they're having success with it because panhandling is now not so profitable and they go away. There's you know, not so many of them. You know, in this discussion, perhaps sometime we might have Barry Feeker talk to us about their role with the people who are panhandling, and I, because I know I've heard sure. them discuss, um, they are a different group that usually use a rescue mission. Mm -hmm. And that, that gets into these are the issues, and they're different people. Um, and so there, it, is, it is a common, it is an issue. Mr. Mayor, thank you. A couple takeaways that I'd want the body to have. This is not to, meant to be any sort of all-inclusive conversation, any conversation that we have. If you think this is helpful, I, I would agree that we'd want him to come in. You know, we, we would have to include a mental health aspect because that's a big piece of this. I think we all recognize that. And that's a contributing factor. But one of the things we certainly want to do is try to be creative. Luther's done some great research. Those signs, I think, could be um, something that the city could use effectively. And as we move forward in our parking study, and if there's potential, we may get rid of meters. That's obviously a question to be determined, but repurposing those meters has, cities have seen success with that. So I think it was a little bit of doom and gloom purposely, but there are some, there's some light at the end of the tunnel and there's some things that we think we can try. Yes, good. Okay, maybe that's as much as we can come together on this. Councilman Ortiz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, when Councilman um, Shum was um, in District 4 and he tried to run an ordinance on um, aggressive panhandling, and I remember, um, I don't know if you guys remember, we received a lot of flack on that. Mm -hmm. um, Topeka is a giving city. Yeah. They're a giving city. And I had calls and emails and letters that said, how dare you not allow us to give? Um, and they were upset that he even bought this forward. I don't know if you guys remember that, yes. Yes. but it's because they want to give. And these panhandlers know that. And yeah, there is uh, mental illness. Um, and, and yes, they know how to get by, but it makes people feel good to give. But at the same time, we do have some that are uh, panhandlers that are real aggressive. Um, I've seen panhandlers fight over corners, territory, um, and, it's, and it is really sad. Um, I know when um, Lana Kennedy was on the uh, force, we went down into the bridge and we talked to several of them. They don't wanna go to the mission because they can't drink there. Yeah. Right. They don't want a bath. They want to be left alone. They want to, you know, so um, that's something that I, I understand what you're saying to change the minds of citizens. But even at, at that, and I thought he had a really good ordinance, but people were very upset that he would even think about bringing that forward because they just say that we're a giving city, and we are a giving city. We are. Yeah, I think the... The aggressive panhandling ordinances have been problematic as well under these same rules because they're, they're content-based. They're, they're regulating speech based on its content. And they've also had some issues with the narrow tailoring problem because a lot of the things that they're trying to regulate as aggressive panhandling fall under other criminal laws, trespassing or assault, disorderly conduct, things like that. So. Those ordinances, a lot of cities passed those when that idea first came out, but they've since, um, some of them have had problems with those. I think uh, approach that, uh, the approach that a lot of cities are using about not necessarily trying to tell people they shouldn't give, but redirecting how they give, uh, putting signs up, advertising, donation meters, on how people can give 
in a different way. Um, and that uh, has a, an effect of eventually it makes the panhandling not so profitable. Okay, it completes the um, one more, Councilwoman um, Hiller. Well, since you brought up the aggressive panhandling, I encouraged a lot of people to watch tonight. And, and my understanding from the time before was that we do have uh, ordinances that, that prohibit aggressive panhandling. And I recall that as sort of a, a, an understood at the end of those discussions before in that if someone comes forward and touches somebody, or, ver or assaults them, which could be a touching or verbally, that that, that is still illegal in Topeka. Is that well, correct? That's, that's what I was saying about our other laws that Understood. the same thing. Yeah, just assault, if you could, battery. Right, yeah. but that still, if somebody goes that far, that's not okay. Sure. Right, right, yeah. right. Oh, okay. Thank you. Anything going? Okay, thank you. This was our legal discourse. We appreciate it. Better understanding. That completes our non-action items. We go to um, announcements, and we'll have the um, Kirk present the preliminary agenda for next week. The October 17th agenda consists of one board appointment to the Topeka Sustainability Advisory Board. We have a Halloween Street Fair and Noto special event ordinance, Top City Custom uh, Car Show for noise exception. We have an expenditure ordinance for September. Action items include a policy and finance committee report and ordinance update for Title II, departments and employees. And then we have a policy and finance committee report update and ordinance for uh, Title 13 on utilities. A public hearing and ordinance for um, a vacation request for BNSF Railway along um, Southeast 8th Street between Southeast Adams and Hancock Street. We have a project budget petition and resolution for street improvement project along Southwest 49th Street from Winnegar Road to BNSF Railroad Crossing. And then we have a J historic Jayhawk Theater development agreement amendment. Non-action items include discussion on the fire department strategic plan. Okay, thank you. Go to the um, deputy. Yes, interim deputy mayor for the deputy city manager. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Gerber. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, two quick announcements. Uh, first, a reminder that the e-cycle event will take place this Saturday at the Expo Center from 9 to 1. Got lots of good stuff last year, so uh, don't hesitate to bring uh, your electronic items that need recycled to uh, the Expo Center this Saturday. And finally, just a comment, um, seeing Colonel Scott and Lieutenant back there, I, you know, it's always a challenging time. It's not always, but it, it can be challenging to be a public employee. And we don't always do a good job uh, saying thank you. And particularly right now for our police department, I think it's important to know that I can speak on all your behalf and say we thank you for the job you're doing and what you're doing to try to keep Topeka safe, so. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Clear. Um, I have nothing except congratulations on the butterfly. Thank you. <laughs> very, very proud. Thank very you. proud of you. Councilwoman Ortiz. Mr. Mayor, I too will congratulate you on Mr. Butterfly. <laughs> I can't even get a bench out there named after me, but I'm trying. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying, okay, but we'll congratulations. Thank you. Um, this is my favorite month, October, because of the fire awareness that we're trying to bring. So as I was sitting here thinking about that, and I know you guys want me to shut up, but I want to thank Brenda. I gave Brenda that little piece of paper and she gave it to her son and he got a smoke alarm. See, she's listening. Karen got her house painted and she had him come out and she's got her smoke alarms. Did you have the firefighters come out? Oh, that was last year. Okay, so, so Sandra's okay. <laughs> Mr. Mayor did. Yes, they've been out. Mr. Henderson, nar, nar, nar. Oh, man. Delisa, nar, nar, nar. <laughs> Dar, nar, nar. <laughs> yes, you did. Mr. Oh, my buddy down there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you had them come out? Because I'm checking a list and I'm checking it twice and I'm gonna find out who's gonna get burned tonight. <laughs> Richard? Actually, I do have one, but it was put in years ago and I kind of forgot about it until I was looking up toward the ceiling and I saw this thing sitting up there and I thought, that's gotta be a smoke alarm. 
So, so Sylvia has been been writing me all these years for nothing. So I I, but, wanna, I will I appreciate your honesty. Um, and I will have um, our fire marshal. Did he leave? I will have him get a hold of you, Richard, and set up a time. Oh my because gosh, you still have. To, it's not hardwired, no, no, Richard, no, no. and no. you haven't changed the battery. <laughs> Richard, you are near and dear to my heart, and I do not want anything to happen. Thank and you. you know what? Like Mr. Jensen, don't be like him and think you know it all. Because you know what? <laughs> I have challenged him. He thinks he's got him. I told him, I bet you you could use another one, but he will not take me up on that challenge because he knows I'm right. <laughs> so I will have that done. And to all of you that have done that, thank you. Thank you for helping our firefighters. And thank you for helping your families. This is important. It's really, really seriously, it's important. And I will challenge Jackie out there. I would, you got yours? I will check that list. I would, Brendan, since I can't have a bench or nothing, a butterfly or nothing, I will challenge you. Tim Rencher, you're getting a new wife. You need a new fire, fire alarm. And I will check with Mr. Martin to see. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councilman, Councilman Emerson. Thank you. And yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, congratulations on the Butterfly Garden. Thank you. And one day I'll have like a sewer pump station named after me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, a couple things in, uh, well, one's close to District 4. It's actually uh, something that me and uh, Ms. Ortiz share. It's uh, next Monday night, uh, the 16th, is the project design open house for the East Topeka Learning Center at Hillcrest from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, you can come and see the plans. It uh, should be a fantastic time. Again, from 6 to 8.30 p.m. at Hillcrest Community Center. But on Saturday, October 14th at 3 p.m. at Highland Park High School, we're gonna have the dedication of the Highland Glen statue, which is the Scotsman and the little Scotty dog and fabulous Freddie Maysburger will be there to do that. Followed at four o'clock by the Hall of Fame and the Sports Wall of Honor, which, of which I am neither, <laughs> at 4 p.m. So that should be a great time. So three and four there at Highland Park this Saturday. Thanks. Thank you. Councilman Isla. Um, again, just to congratulate the mayor. It was wonderful to be at the event and just to hear how highly our community thinks of our mayor. I think that what you've done in our community is wonderful and we still have till January to yeah, celebrate you. Yeah. But what a great celebration. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilman Jensen. Well, I will also congratulate you on uh, the Butterfly Garden. Um, I had the wonderful privilege of going to the Jazz Fest this weekend, and oh my gosh, what a phenomenal event. The weather was unbelievable, the music was unbelievable, incredible crowd in downtown, it was perfect. Uh, to respond to my colleague in the corner, I'm, I'm looking at you. Uh, Last year, uh, I did endeavor to uh, inspect my fire alarms, uh, and I added six, but I'm very conscious about spending my constituents' money, and so I bought and paid for my own. <laughs> so, uh, I, I understand they're free, but nothing in life is free. Uh, somebody pays for those, and so I paid for it and installed my own, uh, but we added six brand new ones, because you're right. Uh, when I crawled up there and what looked did at you the, say? I added six brand new ones. And after that, uh, your manufacturer specifications do. Because do, I'm right. Uh, I, I didn't say that, did Let I? Let the record yeah. reflect that. <laughs> no, and uh, you are correct. And here's what I didn't uh, completely understand was that um, the sensors in those actually go bad after a certain period of time. So even if you change the batteries on the regular schedule like you're supposed to, after a certain period of time, and you'll have to read the manufacturer's instructions, which right are here. very clearly right printed here. on how to install them and where, uh, they do need to be replaced. So I pulled all of mine down and replaced all of them throughout my entire house with brand new ones installed per the manufacturer's specifications. Okay. Ooh. Deputy Mayor Cohen. Um, thank you, wow. Mayor. I'm just going to forgo and too much drama tonight. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Councilman Harmon. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I too want to join the chorus of uh, congratulations on the Butterfly Garden. It was a nice, nice event, and 
And uh, I do want to give a shout out to your most capable assistant, Margot, in putting that together with the assistance of Mrs. Wolgast and keeping it a secret from you was, was really a, um, a monumental achievement and how she yes. did that, I, yes. I don't know, but uh, it was nice and congratulations. Thank you. Councilman Hiller. I will simply echo those as well. It was fun. And for those who know the mayor, if you didn't happen to be there, they, they told him it was all about the butterflies. And he came and launched into his speech just to get us all going with all this data about monarchs and so on before he went ahead and folded it up. And it was fun. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Ortiz. I just want people to know that the smoke alarms are free. That's they right. got a grant and we have to put them up or we won't. Okay. We got to fulfill that grant. And I, and I wanted to say, um, there was a lot of secrets last week. I forgot to mention this. My 10-year-old grandson came home and said, we got to see Kansas, and they took a picture with it. So how Miss Anita is keeping okay. everything quiet? Okay. I need to start having coffee with her, because I was upset that I didn't know yeah. that they were going to Quincy and yeah. performing, and then they also had um, given them a raise some money for a grant. So that's really, really awesome. Yes. So she's keeping too many Thank secrets you. from right. you, Mr. Mayor. You Thank need you. to get on top of that. I think that completes the announcements. Uh, we have one person signed to speak a public comment, Chance Lammer. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. I'm coming to speak to you guys. I've called a couple of you guys on this issue at North and Gordon or Gordon goes um, east and west, and then North Kansas goes north and south. I've been seeing a high volume of cars. The cars on Kansas Avenue coming west, you have a trouble seeing the north or the, you know, south, I guess, on Kansas, excuse me. And then to look east and west from facing south, you can't hardly see them without being in the middle of the intersection. And... I have seen multiple instances where accidents almost have occurred. Um, I'll start out, and I'll tell you, I've grown up in the Nodo Arts District area of my grandparents, and you know, as we grow the Nodo Arts District, there's going to be more and more traffic. I spoke with traffic engineering here three or four months ago. They did a traffic study. I believe it was the September Art Walk that they put up their stuff. They told me they'd get back to me in about a month or so. And I guess it was the August art walk they did this. And so in September, I just kind of waited around. And now I'm like, you know, if anybody ain't going to get back to me, what is the next step that we can do? Because I'm afraid that there's going to be an instant that's going to occur you know, where somebody could either get ran over, a pedestrian or a car. Um, there can be automobile accidents, and it's just a really dangerous intersection. And mm -hmm. I would like to just bring it before the mayor and the city council to see if you guys can look into it and see if we can get any progress or something to be done at that intersection. Because I, I just hate to see something happening with the way the city's growing and the way the Noto Arts District is growing, growing and... I just, I want to see it continue to grow, and I don't want people to, you know, be afraid to come down North Kansas Avenue because they don't know if they're going to get into an accident. And I've heard a lot of people, a lot of customers, a lot of businesses down there say they go through that intersection, and, you know, it kind of turns them away, you know, okay. and by turning people away, you know, that ain't how we grow an arts district, right. and I'll tell you, Mr. Mayor, your wife and... A few others involved down there have done a great job, got us to where we're at, and now we're just going to continue to grow, and I want to thank you guys thank for that you. as well. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Chance. Uh, that completes our public comment tonight. Uh, we have one executive session if the city attorney would provide the parameters.
The motion is to recess into executive session for a period of 20 minutes for consultation with the city's legal counsel to discuss attorney-client privilege matters related to potential litigation as justified by KSA 75-4319B2. In order to aid the discussion, the following individuals should be present, members of the governing body, interim city manager Doug Gerber, financial and administrative services director Nikki Lee, public works director Jason Peak. Chief of Litigation, Shelley Starr, and myself. Okay, those are the parameters. Uh, Council, Council Jensen moves to go into executive session. Deputy Mayor Cohen seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor vote yes. Opposed vote no. Nine yes. Nine having voted yes, we'll go into executive session when the room is closed. Quick break, short break. Let's come back so we can get out of here by 7.30.